Well, we've got quite a few people already in the waiting room. This is a good sign. Yes, as somebody who hosts these online events, I'm well aware of that. <laughs> like, yeah, you never know how many you're going to get. It's, yeah, uh, it really varies. You know, I think we had over a hundred for the biggest one, and then occasionally we'll get a really small one for no obvious reason. It's very hard to predict. Right. Yeah, and our spring break was last week, so the okay, it was a little slow on the getting yeah. word out. And so. I think multimodal is the hot topic, so. Yeah, let's hope so. <laughs> uh, yeah, like I have some thoughts, so. Should we let everyone in and then uh, wait another minute before starting? Yep, I'm going to let everyone in now. Yeah, and okay. then I think Go we're going to start recording. Yeah. I think the recording's already going, if I understand correctly. Yes, correct. Yes, yes. Now I see yeah. that. Sorry about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello everyone, thank you for joining. We're going to wait just another couple of minutes before we begin. Okay, in the interest of time, I think we'll start. Um, so I'll just say a bit about the seminars first and then introduce Bryce and then we'll begin. And I imagine we'll have a few more people trickling in as we go. Um, so welcome everybody to this Civica Social Data Science Seminar Series. Um, this is the last in our spring term uh, set of seminars. And we're very pleased to have with us today uh, Bryce Dietrich, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at Purdue University. Um, now, our seminar series spans a whole range of uh, different kinds of um, social and computational data science. Uh, we have had seminars on a range of different subjects. It's good to see a good turnout here today. I think the uh, we were just saying the um, multimodal approach is particularly exciting right now, so I'm looking forward to hearing what Bryce has to say. Um, so just to introduce him, uh, he's at the Department of Political Science at Purdue University and also a research scholar in the Center for C-SPAN Scholarship and Engagement and the director of the Computational Social Science Lab. His research combines novel quantitative automated and machine learning methods to analyze non-traditional data sources such as audio and video data. And these methods are used to understand the causes and consequences of elite and mass political behavior. In addition to publishing in prominent political science journals, uh, his work has also appeared or is forthcoming in general interest journals like Nature Human Behavior. Ultimately, he aims to make big data and machine learning more accessible, especially to groups traditionally underestimated, underrepresented, and maybe underestimated as well in those research areas. So uh, we're very happy to have you with us, Bryce. Um, if you can go ahead, Bryce will talk for about 45 minutes and then there'll be an opportunity for questions. Um, let me suggest to everybody that if you do want to put your questions in the chat at the beginning, you're welcome to, but otherwise we will save them to the end and I'll only ask, I'll only interrupt Bryce if we have any questions of desperate clarification. Um, the meeting is being recorded, so uh, if you don't wish to be recorded, just keep your um, microphone and your uh, video off. Um, if you would like to ask a question at the end, you can ask it in the chat or you can put your hand up and I'll call on you, but just be aware about the recording. So with that, uh, over to you, Bryce. Let's hear it. All right. Thank you, Erica, for the very kind introduction. Um, let me start my timer here so I make sure I stay on track. Um, 
So uh, the plan for today's talk is I'm going to begin with uh, outlining kind of the motivation of the project that you see in front of your screen, um, which is a collaborative project with Jeff Mondak and Tara Williams. And then after I get through this project, uh, I'm going to wrap up with kind of some general remarks regarding multimodal neural networks in the context of social science research that I think uh, will give some insights in terms of where my thinking is on, on this type of technique and where I think it is moving forward. So without further ado, uh, the first couple of slides I'll move through uh, rather quickly for the sake of time. Uh, these are just the theoretical motivation of the project. And then hopefully I can get to the kind of the methodological component sooner rather than later. So with that said, um, let me go, there we go. Um, Nonverbal information is present in many surface, uh, survey responses, both open and closed uh, questions. However, it's often discarded uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, whether or not it's a respondent altering their tone to emphasize certain words over another, or maybe giving a subtle smile or other types of uh, body language during the course of an open-ended response. This information is uh, not currently accessible to researchers because the techniques and the software and technology is not currently presently available, which this study uh, hopes to remedy. Now, nonverbal information should not be collected in every instance and it by no way is free. Um, however, for scholars who want to use these data, we want to try to provide a set of tools that will allow them to pursue these lines of inquiry. One place where we think that multimodal classification is particularly useful is with emotional engagement, which has been studied heavily in advertising and education. For example, uh, emotionally engaging ads can trigger what are called lower order or type one emotions like activation or arousal. Uh, affecting things like attentiveness, uh, as well as the overall processing of the ad. Ultimately, this promotes learning and the eventual acceptance of the message. However, uh, this emotional processing often occurs well before conscious awareness, which means that if I ask somebody, are you emotionally activated, for example, in a self-reported measure, uh, a lot of the emotional activation occurs prior to that conscious awareness, which means those self-reports are, are um, necessarily incomplete. Consequently, uh, researchers who are interested in studying this topic often rely on physiological measures, most notably uh, facial, um, facial EMGs as well as skin conductive measures. The problem with these measures is that given the necessary laboratory equipment, researchers often have to rely on small convenient samples that are unrepresentative of the population. Uh, moreover, the tasks themselves, since they're do done in a laboratory settings, oftentimes with various things connected to the respondent, uh, in many ways, it might be difficult to port those results to the quote unquote real world in which uh, those responses may be different. Um, consequently, at least when it comes to some laboratory experiments, surveyors and researchers have relied increasingly on online surveys in order to increase the representatives of the population when conducting an experiment. However, the aforementioned physiological measures cannot be administered in such an environment. So our argument is that we can passively collect nonverbal information during the course of an in-person online and telephone surveys, and this could potentially provide a remedy for these problems. Um, for example, telephone data has been used in a number of studies to classify emotions, mostly from call centers, including activation and arousal, which is the focal point of this study. Video data has similarly been used in these settings to classify emotional engagement, which is why it might be well suited to use for social science purposes. However, we're in no, aware of no study to date which has attempted to capture and analyze similar data in a multimodal framework during the course of an in-person online and telephone survey in which respondents are simply asked what they like and dislike about presidential candidates or some question of that ilk. So the goal of this paper is to introduce a methodology that we think could be of general use to social science researchers. However, in order to guide this discussion, we, pause, we developed two main hypotheses that I will test during the course of the study and something that we explore more deeply in the paper. So the first hypothesis that respondents will respond will be more emotionally engaged when they are explaining what they dislike about the opposing party candidate as of compared to what they like. This draws heavily from the effective polarization literature which shows that political opinions are increasingly defined by a dislike of the opposing party and its members. Similarly, we know from psychology that the negative emotions have a greater influence on behavior especially when it comes to candidate evaluations, which is why we would expect these to be especially salient when it comes to something as simple as whether or not a respondent is emotionally engaged. 
We also think that this is ultimately going to impact behavior. Um, the behavior that we are going to be considering in this study is vote choice. Uh, specifically, we argue, we expect that respondents who are more emotionally engaged when explaining what they like about a candidate as opposed to what they dislike will be more likely to vote for that candidate. So is emotional engagement the only way that multimodal classification can be used to analyze survey data? No. Uh, should emotional engagement be assessed in every instance uh, that a survey researcher might want to study voting behavior? No. Uh, but in instances where people are interested in things like emotional engagement, which there's a large literature to this effect, or things that are, are akin to physiological measures that could be done in a laboratory setting, we think that the methodology introduced in the study could be of particular utility. So there's a lot of steps in this process. The benefit of what we are providing for researchers is that many of these steps we have already done and will be incorporated into a Python module that can be implemented on your own computer. However, for those who want to try to train a multimodal classifier, using survey research. This is how we attempted uh, it in this study. And I think those are generalizable steps that could be useful for other purposes. So the first is collecting training data. So the data that we use in this study is audio video recordings of in-person telephone and online interviews from 2012, 2019, and 2020. Uh, sorry, all the, all the Zoom notifications are disrupting my keyboard arrow key. Uh, so I apologize for that. But in each of these surveys, uh, respondents explained what they liked and disliked about the major presidential candidates. Uh, these were open into responses akin to traditional survey questions that you're familiar with from the ANES, the American National Election Studies, or, or, or uh, similar surveys. So in 2012, the surveys were in person and telephone and were conducted in a single county in Kentucky shortly after the presidential election. In 2019, the telephone survey was an RDD surveyed mostly from the state of Iowa in November. And then finally, the 2020 Qualtrics survey was a panel that was done uh, shortly before and after the presidential election and was drawn from a nationally representative sample. Uh, in total, there were a, a little over a thousand responses in the in-person telephone and online surveys. Uh, as you'll find out, once we got to a point where we could obtain usable uh, text, audio, and video data from these individuals, it narrowed down to about 750 or so. Uh, so there's some of these individuals uh, did not give uh, us enough information in order to estimate a score for their answers. So for the online survey, um, the main way that we acquired uh, audio and video data is developing a Qualtrics plugin that can be implemented in Java uh, using some steps that we outlined in the appendix. Essentially, respondents were asked to record themselves answering like and dislikes questions. Prior to this, they were given a little tutorial about how to use the plugin. Um, once that information is obtained, um, uh, for the online surveys, this was not a problem because individuals are recording themselves, but for in-person and telephone surveys, oftentimes what happens is that the interviewer, uh, is speaking over sometimes, but oftentimes they're just on the audio file, uh, that is associated with a given response. And so in order to, uh, segment, uh, that, uh, speaker, the interviewer from the interviewee, um, you have to use uh, uh, an algorithm that is uh, associated with speaker dialogization. So the algorithm that we trained for this model was an X-vector neural network that was pre-trained in Caldi, which is uh, a command line tool that is well suited for this type of task. Essentially, it only does uh, speaker segmentation problems. Initially, uh, the voice samples were identified using a support vector machine because Caldi cannot uh, segment speakers on unvoiced samples. The X vectors were then extracted from those samples and they were inputted into what was called the call home diarization model, the citation of which is in the paper. Uh, this model was trained on individuals calling home. So it's two speakers on a telephone uh, having a conversation, which is very similar to the type of data that we were using in this study where you have an interviewer and interviewee engaging on, on a conversation, if you will, over a question about a given presidential candidate. So in order to assess the effectiveness of this, uh, we randomly sampled 114 audio files and correctly separated the interviewer from respondent 87% of the time. Now, in some instances, um, you'll see uh, these types of scores be slightly higher for these type of segmentation problems. In some instances, you would see them to be slightly lower, but we're fairly confident that this is, um, is pretty good given the nature of the data that we are using. 
So the other innovation uh, in this uh, project is how do you actually code something like emotional engagement? Um, so the steps in this process initially were we developed a survey question in which we just described what emotional engagement and activation was in, in text form. We provide lengthy paragraphs with bullet points and examples. And we found that our labelers were, were very <laughs> unsuccessful at parsing all of that uh, textual information to assess engagement. And so then I thought, well, a better way to assess emotional engagement is to think specifically in terms of the nonverbal behavior of the speaker. And so consequently, we developed this scale, which is uh, uh, please consider the following faces. So this would be the positive scale. Which face do you think the respondent is making when he or she is expressing his or her opinion about the person or group under consideration with one being least emotionally engaged and five being the most emotionally engaged? This is the negative scale, exact same scale, but now we see more frowny or angry faces, if you will, again, with a one being the least emotionally engaged and a five being the most emotionally engaged. So ultimately, we found that this worked fairly well. Um, so before we annotated the full training set, we, we first established intercoder reliability using a random sample of 50 uh, video and audio responses. Uh, all three coders, two graduate, one undergraduate, annotated all the sample files. Intercoder reliability was calculated using the interclass correlation coefficient. Since we ultimately want to randomly assign two coders to all files in our larger training set and then take the average, we set K equals two and used a random effects model. And ultimately for our initial sample, the ICC was 0.81, which has just been described in literature as quote unquote good reliability. So in thinking about the performance of interclass reliability, uh, inter intercoder reliability, as well as the performance of the speaker segmentation step, recall that both of these, uh, what's important to note is that both of these things are working against the performance of the model because this is introducing uh, noise into our training data, which means that then when we use a multimodal framework to predict these labels, it is increasing the error rate of that model. So at, so I would argue that what we are presenting is actually a conservative estimate of the performance of a multimodal framework for this type of classification problem. And could certainly be improved with more training of labelers in terms of things like emotional engagement, whatever the researcher may want, or a better or more fine tuned version of the diarization organization step, or even manually segmenting speakers, you should see higher performance. But as we'll find out, our model did really well. And so we were actually not concerned about these steps. So for the video data, um, one of the problems with the video data is that unlike an audio file, in, in, a video, in the video data step, we have to use individual frames in order to summarize uh, the facial reactions, et cetera, of the respondent within the video. So how do you do that? How do you know which frames uh, are necessary to summarize a video? So in computer science, uh, this problem is noted is called keyframe extraction. And we used an algorithm that is commonly used in that field to extract the frames that are uh, that best summarize the video file that we were fed, uh, feeding it. Essentially what this is looking for are scene changes. So if you were to apply keyframe extraction to something like a political ad, you would get different scenes in the political ad, generally speaking. In our type of video, it's, very, it's mostly just looking at where the respondent maybe moved their head a little bit more dramatically than others. It's typically what it picks up on. Once the keyframes were extracted, which is in frame A, we then used a, a hard cascade to facially crop, so zoom in the individual's face, because we thought that that would be most informative to their emotional engagement with the question that they're answering. So um, step five uh, is, we found uh, is certainly helpful, especially when you have a, a low, a small amount of data in order to train the neural network with, uh, but certainly is not necessary if you have a sufficiently large data set. Um, so step five is data augmentation, which is commonly used to augment the data set to give the algorithm more information about what things might look like out of the training sample or uh, out of sample. So to do this, we ran a research assistance labeled a 25% random sample of likes and dislikes st statements. 20% were used for validation, 80% were used for training. That is based on the base um, training set that I alluded to in the previous slides. The audio augmentation step, we essentially created two copies of the data. So the first copy, uh, the training data included random white noise. So we just randomly added white noise to the training data to simulate different phone qualities that we might obtain out of sample. Um, the second step was to create a copy of uh, training data 
in which the volume was randomly increasing and decreasing, again, to create a version of the data set that would simulate different types of phones out of sample, which we thought would improve performance. The tech augmentation step is a little bit trickier. And so essentially what we did was create two versions of the text data in which we created in, imputed semantically similar words using either WordNet or word to vec So what this means is that if somebody says, I like Joe Biden, for example, um, we wanna also um, capture instances where somebody might say, I love Joe Biden, since like and love might be semantically similar to one another. Now, in instances where like and love and those statements exist in the training set, that is not a problem out of sample. However, let's imagine a world where the only words that we have describing Joe Biden in the training set is, I like Joe Biden. And there's no instances in the training set of, I love Joe Biden. We want to give that information to the algorithm so it can collect, uh, correctly classify instances of I love, I love Joe Biden out of sample. And that's exactly what we tried to accomplish in the text augmentation step. The image augmentation step is most akin to what we did with the television data, or sorry, the telephone data or the audio data. Uh, in the first copy of the training data, we include a randomly uh, varying level of blurriness to again affect, uh, to give the algorithm information on randomly different types of web cameras, et cetera. Um, similarly, we did the same thing with brightness, which again, because in some instances, the camera might be brighter or it might be uh, darker, blurrier, not blurrier. And so all of this is meant to give the algorithm additional information when trying to label uh, or classify the training set uh, and improve performance out of sample. Again, I think that in instances where you have a sufficiently large amount of training data, this data augmentation step is not necessary. Uh, but for our purposes, our training sample is relatively small given the scope of the classification problem. And so we thought that data augmentation made sense in the sentence and ultimately we found that it did improve performance out of sample. So uh, this very crude graph that I ultimately discarded from the paper because I thought it didn't do uh, what the algorithm that we developed for the study justice, but it does provide a nice summary of ultimately what we're trying to do. Um, so in the bottom portion of this graph, we see the intensity score, which is gonna range from one to five with one being the lowest or least engaged, emotionally engaged, and five being the highest emotionally engaged. On the left uh, node here, uh, we have an audio convolutional neural network that is classifying the audio stream in this multimodal classification problem. So this neural network is uh, predominantly using MEL frequency coefficients in order to classify the intensity scores. So MEL frequency coefficients, uh, for a lack of a better description, is, is very similar to uh, what word to vec might provide for class for text data. So if we're trying to describe, um, let's say an audio file, typically the things that matter are uh, the decibel level or so the extent to which the, the audio intensity or volume is decreasing during the duration of the file and then the frequencies. And we're interested in instances where we see spikes, which would be like a high change in frequency that is also associated with a change in decibel level. So all of this is summarized in what is called a spectrogram, which is essentially an image that summarizes the entirety of an audio signal. However, a spectrogram is very difficult to in, impute or include in this type of classification framework and has been shown in other studies to be, do a poor job for a variety of reasons in audio classification problems. So MEL frequency coefficients essentially provide that type of summary information that you provide in a spectrogram as a vector of, of numbers. In this instance, we use 20 mel frequency coefficients for this problem. So the text convolutional neural network is based on um, word embeddings. Uh, so all the text is converted to word embeddings. Those are piped then into an intensity score using a recurrent neural network, uh, even though it does say convolutional neural network, that is an error. It's a recurrent neural network in the paper. Um, and the image convolutional neural network is a standard uh, image convolutional neural network in which, um, which has been used in a variety of studies in political science. So I will not spend a ton of time talking about that. Uh, so all of these, uh, the output of each of these sections of the algorithm, instead of thinking of predicting a single intensity score, instead what is outputted is a vector of uh, five numbers for each of these steps. That vector is then combined using a dense layer into the intensity score at the bottom, which is happening here at the bottom section of this pipeline. And then when we train this model, all of the weights for each section of the algorithm or each pipe of the algorithm is estimated simultaneously with the pooling weights 
that are being done at the end of this model. And I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about that in Q&A. So um, the loss function that we used for this uh, model was the mean, which I think I have here, yep, mean absolute percent error. Uh, there's other loss functions that you can use for continuous variables, uh, but we found that this use worked pretty well for our purposes, and it's been used in a variety of uh, sections of the literature. So to understand what these scores are at the top, um, uh, let's look at this one for the Qualtrics data. So this used both audio, text, and image data for this estimate. The actual intensities, if the actual intensity score was one, then the model would return on average a value between 0 0.980 and 1.020 because the final MAPE in this instance is a percent. So it means that the score returned by the model is going to be off by approximately plus or minus 2% 2 percentage, 2% uh, based on the face score. So if the model, if the actual intensity score was a five, then the model would turn on average a value between 4.90 and 5.098. Uh, so to us, this meant that the model performed remarkably well for our purposes. Um, but we also found that the text data didn't actually add much to the model. In fact, it, it, de it decreased the performance of the model. Uh, the best uh, model that we estimated using all different combinations of our data was the model that only used the audio and video data and excluded the text data. Now, some might say that we're stacking the deck in, in some sense to find this type of result because the training data is being labeled using this scale, which is asking our labelers to key on the nonverbal information. That's a fair point. But again, remember that the goal of this study is to estimate emotional engagement, which we argue and other people have argued is primarily a, a measured using a physiological reaction that automatically occurs prior to conscious awareness which means that the nonverbal information is precisely what we want, especially if we're trying to mimic things like facial EMGs or skin conductance measures, which are typically used in this field. Obviously, if you had a different prompt that maybe keyed individuals to look more at text data, then you might find slightly different results. But again, the reason why we settled on this scale is that we had, very, uh, we had a lot of difficulty obtaining intercoder reliability using a text prompt for this task. So, um, all right. So in order to measure emotional engagement, um, there's a lot of different ways to approach this problem. Uh, I ultimately thought that a network-based measure made the most sense given the, the, um, the novelty of the data that we had collected. So for each response, so this would be a single response that an individual might give to a candidate like or dislike question, we did the following. So for each response, we conducted, constructed a weighted graph in which the nodes are adjacent words and the edges are weighted by the extent to which emotional, in, emotional intensity or engagement increase from one word to the next. These values are scaled such that a 0.5 means that there's no change in intensity from one word to the next. And a values greater than 0.5 means that the intensity increased from the first word to the second word. And values less than 0.5 means that the intensity decreased from the first to second word. So the reason why we scaled things in this way is that we ultimately use Dijkstra's algorithm on the back end of this to calculate the average weighted distance for each of these response graphs with larger values implying greater distance and more emotional engagement because it suggests that as the response is going from one word to the next, the engagement level is going up and up and up and up and up uh, during the duration of the response. So the reason why we have to scale them this way is that we can't have negative weights using this framework. So we have to have something that ranges between zero and one, which is why we settled on this scale. So, um, so our first uh, hypothesis uh, is that emotional engagement is highest during uh, out-party dislike statements because what we know from uh, the effective polarization literature, and this is ultimately what we found. Uh, looking at these bars, this is the average weighted distance across all of these types of questions. So what this means is that for every file that we have in which an individual is explaining what they dislike about the opposing party candidate in this instance on the far left, we create those response graphs for each of those responses. We calculate Dijkstra's, uh, the average weighted distance for that, which again means higher values imply greater spread over those networks, implying greater emotional activation because it implies a ratcheting effect during the duration of the response. Um, so uh, what we find is on the left, the highest instance of this is when people are explaining uh, what they dislike about the opposing party system, uh, uh, opposing party candidates, 
we find the largest average weighted distance across all those responses, which we argue means that the individuals are most emotionally engaged when explaining what they dislike about opposing party candidates. They're the least emotionally engaged when they're explaining what they like about opposing, opposing party candidates, as indicated by the smaller bar on the left panel of this figure. Uh, this is very consistent with what effective polarization, the effective polarization literature would say about how people process information. But the reason why this is noteworthy is because remember what we're capturing here is very subtle changes in nonverbal behavior that is different. In, these, in this graph, there is no information about what is actually being said in terms of the words being used. This is purely based on how people are reacting nonverbally. And the fact that we see what we know from survey results with respect to effective polarization in simple nonverbal behaviors, I think supports the idea that effective polarization is not something like strategic thinking on behalf of the voters, that there's genuine emotional attachments to those opinions that are being reflected in these open-ended responses. Now in the appendix, we create a random version of this to say, okay, what happens if we take random graphs uh, from the respondents to try to give some sense of what these measures should look like under pure random chance. And these are much higher than what we would expect given uh, pure random chance, which means that I think this measure is capturing something that's systematic within the survey data that we're ultimately using. So uh, we find support for the first hypothesis, which is respondents will be more emotionally engaged when they're explaining what they dislike about the opposing party as compared to what they like. Now, for people who care about emotional engagement, this might be enough to justify going through the effort to collect nonverbal information from in-person telephone or um, online surveys. However, again, I, this is only one of the use cases that we think it could be, uh, the methodology that we introduced could be uh, useful for, um, And but the steps are gonna be the same regardless of whether or not you're classifying emotional engagement or maybe something like attentiveness or maybe something like deception or whatever you want to do with the survey information, um, the, the steps would be largely the same, but the, the, the tools that we're gonna be providing and the model that is going to be the plug and play model that you can use in Python is gonna be tied to emotional engagement. So before we get to the second hypothesis, which is predicting behavior, vote choice, I need to explain the measure that is used in that hypothesis. So again, um, the hypothesis is triggered based on a comparative, um, uh, a comparative calculation between the intensity level that somebody might have when they're explaining what they like or dislike about a given candidate. So in order to capture that in our responses, we first created what was called out party intensity, which is simply for each respondent we took all the answers that they gave about a particular, uh, about an opposing party candidate, about what they disliked about that opposing party candidate. And we subtract the average weighted distance from all of their responses about what they liked about that same opposing party candidate. And the difference of which we called out party intensity, which means a positive value implies that the individual is going to be more disliking of the out party candidate. Sorry, will have more emotional engagement when explaining what they dislike about the out party candidate versus what they dislike about the, about the, sorry, what they like about the opposing party candidate. In party intensity is the exact same measure, except it's done for the, their own party's candidate. So here it will be positive if the individual is more emotionally engaged when they're explaining what they dislike about their own party's candidate versus what they like about their own party's candidate. So the reason why we centered on this type of framework is because again, we think that um, the effective polarization literature is a good framework for thinking about how this could impact something like vote choice and ultimately found strong evidence that it does. Um, so the two models that are highlighted on the left use the audio, only use audio and image data for these estimates. The two models on the right also incorporate text information when making those estimates. And what we find is that for the most part, the out party intensity score, that difference between the uh, average weighted distance or the level of emotional engagement when describing what you dislike about the opposing party candidate versus what you like, again, with positive values implying that you're more emotional engagement when you're explaining what you dislike about the opposing party candidate, that is easily the most consistent predictor in each of these models um, as shown here. The dependent variable in this instance is whether or not the individual casted a vote, a vote for their own party's candidate. Here we're presenting simple logistic regressions with uh, fixed effects for each survey that is pooled into this data set. However, um, in the appendix, we also use different um, estimation schemes to account for the fact that in-party votes are not super rare, you know, uh, but they're certainly not as prevalent as uh, out-party votes. 
sorry, inverted, in-party votes, much more prevalent than out-party votes uh, in the data set, but we're presenting simple logistic regressions uh, just for the sake of uh, simplicity. So this provides evidence that respondents who are emotionally engaged when explaining what they like about a candidate as opposed to what they dislike will be more likely to vote for that candidate. Um, however, we think it's noteworthy to demonstrate that the effect that we outlined in that previous table, especially with respect to out-party intensity, is not trivial with respect to variables that we know influence things like in-party voting. Specifically, party identification strength is a variable, a continuous variable that ranges from zero, meaning that the individual was either leaning towards their party or uh, somebody who's leaning towards their political party, uh, to a three, which would be somebody who had indicated that they were strong, uh, strongly affiliated with their political party. So this would be a variable that you would expect, in, as it shows here, is highly predictable. Uh, it has a large effect on the in-party vote choice, but out-party intensity is comparable. So the average marginal effect here is, was estimated using a standardized version of the variables in which we took each variable, subtracted the mean, divided by the standard deviation, so everything is on the same scale. So what this means is that for out-party intensity, a standard deviation increase in out-party intensity would increase the probability that somebody votes for their own party by about 6%. The exact same thing is found for party identification strength. Now, if you know anything about estimating uh, the effects, uh, the, 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 the effect of individual variables and trying to compare them in the context of a logic model, it's not entirely straightforward. So I'm not going to say that out party intensity is more important than party identification strength when explaining vote choice, but it certainly demonstrates that there's a, um, a non-trivial effect that we're isolating using the measure that we created for this study. The second half of the table, I'd also like to point out that the effect size for out party intensity, the average marginal effect for out party intensity on the bottom is 0 0.03, which is exactly half the effect of out party intensity in 0 0.06. So this says that when we add text data to the estimate of our measure, that the impact of that measure on the prediction, the, the prediction of the vote choice is approximately decreased by half. Does this mean that text data should never be incorporated into this multimodal framework? No, but it certainly means that in our context, adding text data doesn't help us in any way when trying to estimate something like emotional engagement using the scale that we developed for the study. So the next thing I want to talk about is ways uh, in instances where this model, uh, this, this approach could be particularly, especially useful, or maybe instances where we can improve what we've talked about uh, already up to this point. So ultimately, we found that in longer responses that our measure performed better, which is not surprising given the complexity of the task at hand. Uh, specifically, this affected in-party intensity. So shorter responses in this instance are individuals who gave responses uh, as a subset of the data where individuals gave responses that were um, essentially below the median on all question levels. So this would be somebody who was below the median when describing their response length, duration of the response was below the median when describing what they liked about an out party candidate, what they disliked about an out party candidate, what they uh, uh, liked about an in party candidate, so forth and so on. And so because of that, um, the, for the most part, the responses that we had um, were relatively short uh, in many of these instances, as indicated by the subsets that we have here. The majority of people fell into this shorter response category. Uh, however, we found that for people who could articulate longer responses, especially with respect to the in-party questions, that the uh, coefficients, the size of the coefficients increased uh, exponentially, maybe not exponentially, but noticeably for in-party intensity, and certainly did the same for out-party intensity, which implies that longer responses are certainly better for our measure. Um, specifically, I wanted to draw your attention to column A. So these are the average marginal effects out of these models. And we can see that in-party strength uh, almost triples, uh, but when you have, um, when you move from shorter to longer responses, which is again, at what we saw in the previous table, but we find essentially no similar increase for in-party intensity with respect to text strength uh, when text data is incorporated into the model. Uh, I interpret this as suggesting that text data is not, maybe uh, arguably text data might not be as reliant, at least in this task, on having longer responses when it comes to in-party intensity, but certainly is something worth exploring in terms of the amount of data needed in order to attain some sort of uh, standard of excellence with respect to this classification problem using only audio and video data 
versus text data. Maybe text data doesn't have a larger impact on vote choice uh, when it comes to this type of measure, but maybe you need less text uh, data to obtain kind of a minimum level of performance, which is something I think researchers could certainly explore moving forward. So in summary, I think we have strong evidence, at least when it comes to the emotional engagement scale that we use in the study, that audio and video data is certainly something that researchers should think about if they're interested in emotional engagement uh, in the context of the study. However, um, I think that uh, for people who are generally interested in these types of automated responses that are captured in physiological measures, uh, I think using the approach that we have in the study and using the tools that we create in the study, we certainly have found evidence that this might allow for people to move those studies maybe outside of a laboratory setting and perhaps to something like ball tricks or a telephone interview and get reasonable results in that context. Um, again, the software implementation that we'll be providing is not only the Qualtrics plugin, which would allow for individuals to record themselves answering questions on that platform, but also a module that can be loaded into Python that would allow people to use the algorithm that we trained for, the, for this study for their own research. However, at this point, I think it's necessary to take a step back and just, and just mention that, you know, even though you can think of nonverbal information associated with open-ended or closed-ended question is quote unquote free, meaning that people are providing nonverbal information during the course of these responses. Why not capture it for research purposes? It is not entirely free because there's important ethical considerations when you're recording individuals, especially video recording individuals. And we talk about uh, the best way to manage that type of data in the study uh, if you're interested in using this for your own purposes. And also just the broader ethical questions related to nonverbal paradata is what we call it, or paradata writ large, which could be anything ranging from mouse clicks to um, uh, facial recognition or something along those lines. Um, we went to great extents to get consent of all of our respondents, which may have uh, perhaps made our, uh, you know, the purpose of our study uh, more transparent, which could theoretically work against us finding kind of the significant results that we do find. But certainly consent uh, needs to be requested and we need to think about what consent looks like in this type of framework moving forward, uh, because I do think that there's ethical questions that need to be raised if individuals are interested in pursuing this uh, line of research for their own purposes. So I wanna end with two concluding remarks that I alluded to at the beginning of the talk uh, that kind of frame my thinking about multimodal classification and the topics and information that was presented in this talk. So first, Nonverbal information is a complement, but not a substitute. Um, there's lots of ways to capture emotion. Text and surveys-based measures are certainly useful. Um, they certainly can help explain political behavior. But for individuals who care about um, physiological or automated responses, uh, which is certainly myself and others in the field, uh, which I alluded to at the beginning of the talk, nonverbal information could provide an important complement to traditional measures in that area especially with respect to generalizing their results outside of kind of an artificial laboratory setting. Are surveys, you know, not artificial? Uh, certainly not, but it, maybe it's a different type of artificiality that could be help expand those results beyond the scope of inquiry that are currently limited to, given the nature of the physiological measures that need to be uh, collected. And again, in this talk, I'm talking about emotional engagement, emotional activation. There's a lot of other, to other topics that you could potentially use this type of approach to analyze uh, in, this, in, in this way. The second type of um, conclude, the second concluding remark is just about where I think machine learning uh, is going and should go in social science research. So first, machine learning can be a lot more than just prediction. So this classic article by Quinn et al kind of introduced uh, unsupervised modeling to text classification problems in political science. And the justification for this is that coding documents is really hard. So we need unsupervised learning to essentially lower our research costs when conducting a study on the, uh, what is said in the US Senate, for example. However, in computer science and elsewhere, machine learning is being used for more inferential purposes, especially with respect, with respect to neural networks. But I think it's worth thinking about and hopefully this study will generate some of those discussions. Specifically, there's a whole field of, of uh, there's a whole section of literature under the rubric of cognitive neural science in which neural networks are not just used to combine data together and try to predict some sort of outcome, but the structure of a neural network is thought of as being a mimic 
the human brain, which means that we can use that neural network structure in a multimodal approach to then get insights in terms of how people are processing information given the task at hand. Um, so specifically, there are two camps within this literature. And one, models are constructed using uh, existing data to understand existing data using a neural network framework. But others, models are constructed to understand what the brain is actually doing. Uh, and I think that the second camp is something that has yet to come to political science or the social science, but I think it soon will be based on what is happening in this field. Specifically in this paper, examples of this type of this line of thinking is introduced in the appendix with respect to gradient class activation maps. So what a gradient activation map allows a researcher to do is essentially put their thumb on different sections of the neural network to get a sense of which sorts of things uh, the neural network is looking at, if you will, when making classification decisions on the task at hand. So this is showing that in general, when we use the image only model, that for the most part, the model is triggering, uh, is focusing on things that are related to this. Uh, this is one of the RAs in the study uh, related to her face when making an assessment about the level of emotional engagement. Um, but I think that if we use, if we think about the labeling process as undergraduates processing information about survey respondents, then this type of approach would give us a sense of what sorts of things in an image an undergraduate might be looking at when making an assessment about something like emotional engagement, or maybe something as, uh, something like the sentiment of a political ad, I think is a useful application. So I created a similar gra gradient class activation map for the audio data. This actually did not exist in the literature. Gradient class activation maps for image data are very prevalent, very easy to find, very easy to execute. But using that framework, I thought of a way to apply that to audio data as well in a similar fashion where I'm putting my thumb on the scale of different sections of the neural network to get a sense of when in an audio file is the most important information when it comes to the classification task. And what this is showing is that the darker shades are the part of that audio file that is most predictive of the ultimate score that my RA gives. And what you see is that the RA, assuming that the neural network is a reflection of how their brain is actually processing that information, earlier parts of the audio files where the decision is made and then there's this ebb and flow that happens throughout the duration of the audio file in which maybe that assessment is being updated throughout the course of the file. Now, are these perfect tools for um, understanding information processing? Perhaps not. Uh, are neural networks perfect reflections of the human brain? Probably not. But I do think that we can start using a multimodal framework, not just to improve the results of classification problems, but also to put our thumbs on the scales of different parts of that neural network to get a sense of what really matters in terms of the labels that are being provided. And again, in this context, yes, labels can be thought of as a machine learning sense as just training data. But I also think we can think of labels as individuals responding to the information that we're giving them. And hence, when I say that the text information is not as important to the classification press, I'm not just saying that from a pure kind of nuts and bolts sense. But I'm also saying that to the people who are being asked, the humans that are being asked to evaluate that information, they don't seem to be queuing on it nearly as much, which gives us some insights in terms of how those individuals are processing the information. So with that, I will conclude and look forward to answering any questions that people have. Uh, and thank you so much for attending. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much, Bryce, for a really exciting and engaging talk. Um, I'm sure there will be questions in the chat. Let me just encourage all of our participants here to put your questions in the chat and just remind you that the meeting is still being recorded. So if you would like me to read out your question, you can put it in the chat. Uh, if you would okay. like to unmute and ask it yourself, then please put your hand up and I'll call on you. And um, Erica, if, if you yes. would do that little trick that you did earlier to get these slides off of my screen. That, uh -huh. uh, I will do that. That would be great. Uh, Thank you. Yes. There we are. Now we can see your face. Fantastic. Good. Um, so yes, please do put questions in the chat and maybe I'll kick us off by asking a very general and maybe slightly provocative question. <laughs> um, I wonder, I can imagine um, sort of... Cambridge Analytica and uh, political advertisers rubbing their hands, looking at this, thinking, hmm, what are the key messages for me in terms of, uh, you know, perhaps increasing the emotional content of political advertisements to uh, to ramp up this sort of emotional engagement? Um, do you think that that is an outcome of this or do you think that that's uh, 
you know, who do, who do you think will be looking at this and and potentially thinking about using these results uh, in the political sphere? Would would it be um, election predictions and that sort of thing? Would it be advertisers? So my my answer is twofold. So first, uh, obviously, for researchers and other people interested in something like political ads. Um, and how people respond to political ads, you know, the technology and the approach introduced in this study is very well applied to that type of setting. And I think that your point, uh, your point is, is well made. Um, and it relates to this, uh, you know, I, I try to allude to this in the conclusion of the talk, but it's a little bit more fleshed out in the paper. It's just these broader ethical questions that, you know, multimodal classification is introducing to these types of tasks. Um, like there's questions, so, for example, um, you know, uh, I would say five to 10 years ago, uh, this idea of, okay, so we have a Zoom meeting. Let me record all of the videos in the Zoom meeting and classify people's emotional states. Uh, I think people wouldn't bat an eye about that maybe five or 10 years ago, but, you know, Zoom tried to do this and there was a lot of press because, like, things like consent are becoming, especially in a machine learning context, when it comes to those types of tasks, I think is, is a, a debate that is happening now that I hope that this study will at least demonstrate that, yes, we can obtain data online of people talking. We can use nonverbal information to get some insights and kind of subtle changes in their behavior. Uh, but it's also important to think about, you know, consent in that instance, research participants in that instance, precisely because, you know, if... Cambridge Analytica or whomever wants to use this type of approach, we want to make sure that respondents are well aware of what they're participating in when they give them that type of information. And honestly, I think that that's a broader question that applies not just to this type of project, but yeah, anything absolutely. ranging from autonomous vehicles to whatever. Yeah. Yeah, completely. Um, I don't see any hands, but do feel free to put your hands up, please, audience, if you have any questions. Um, well then, oh no, we do have a hand. Uh, Natasha, do you want to ask your question? If you can. Um, yes, I would. Um, so thank you. And I think I have two questions and they were mostly um, from step five, but it was under the audio that um, the test, I think the test, um, the testers you use had like white noises and random increased and decreased volume. So my question would be, do you think that tonal variation would like um, play a part because there's a difference between saying, for example, I like Joe Biden in like a nonchalant type of way and saying I like Joe Biden in like a um, excited and enthusiastic way. And second would be about um, the video for under like the um, facial features were the most important other the graded, graded weighted class action map. Um, did you take into consideration, for example, um, different races because um, the different races have certain um, predominant features and if you used one race, would the data be kind of skewed or maybe incorrect in some way? That would be my question. Those are my two questions, thank you. Yeah, so let me deal with the first question first. Um, so, the, so the data augmentation step is interesting in this study because the goal here is to provide uh, a plug and play model that people could use their own audio image and text data that they collected from their own survey and just use the algorithm that we trained at this study and get scores of emotional engagement. So in that instance, data augmentation makes a lot of sense because you, so yes, so at, at a minimum, you wanna give the algorithm when it's training more scenarios in terms of what the validation data set might look like uh, once you try to obtain uh, the validation statistics. But also if, if I wanna create something in which a lot of different types of data can be potentially used with this model, then incorporating things like, you know, augmented data for things like phone quality or image quality, et cetera, I think makes sense in that context. Now, the reason why each of these are, there's two copies in these, in these instances and there had to be choices being made is that with the data augmentation step, you have to make sure that each data set is the same for each section of the algorithm that you're training, which means that if you have two augmentation steps for the audio data, you need to have two for the text data, two for the image data. And the audio augmentation steps are well covered in the literature. And so those are kind of standard data augmentation steps in the literature. 
but the text in the image augmentation steps were me just thinking about what this could potentially look like for people outside of this study using it on their own data. And so I created augmentation steps that I thought would reflect that. So gradient class activation step maps, I'm super excited about. Um, I think your point about different race, et cetera, very well put. Um, I wanna take a step back and say that my main problem with gradient class activation maps is that we don't know what the confidence intervals looks like on something like a heat map in this instance. And so I've been thinking about different ways to create kind of random samples of images, create confidence intervals based on the heat maps that are being created, which would provide us a more kind of range of performance in terms of where people are focusing on these individual images. Typically the way gradient class activation maps are presented in the literature is that somebody's like, oh, look, uh, I'm trying to identify different objects in this image. Look, it's focusing on this dog. That means that the model is performing well. Um, but I think that for, so, for inference purposes, we need to have more, uh, we need to have a standard error around that estimate. And so I've been thinking about different ways to do that, uh, that would help not only answer your question, but other questions. Thank you. Do we have any other hands? We've got a couple of questions in the chat, so I'll go to those next. Um, could you uh, say a bit more about why it is that the models with added textual data have smaller and less significant effects than those limited to audio and visual features? I mean, you've said a bit about this already, but maybe just to reflect on what's actually driving that. Yeah, so the first thing is that I think that certainly the label, like the labeling task is influencing this for sure, because yeah. if you're asking people to key on nonverbal information, that that means that they're gonna be paying less attention to the text information. Um, second, I would say that from a theoretical sense, um, you know, when you talk, when you read literature on emotional activation, emotional engagement, for the most part, self-reports and text-based measures, you just don't see a lot of that because what we're talking about is subtle changes in the overall emotional state of an individual. So yes, somebody could say, I hate Joe Biden or I hate Donald Trump, uh, and that would certainly capture kind of emotional engagement. Um, but oftentimes the way people engage with these questions is that you don't see those types of extremities. Like, yes, you might have one respondent who just goes nuts and says just some awful things about a presidential candidate. But generally speaking, the, what, the, what my RAs found and what I kind of already knew to be true is that when people answer candidate like and dislike questions, emotionality is not the same as somebody going crazy on Twitter or something like that. Emotionality in this context is very subtle changes. And honestly, what engagement looks like, emotional engagement looks like in these questions is a difference between a respondent who seems to be phoning it in, so to speak, and entirely disengaged with the prompt, just giving an answer for the sake of giving an answer versus somebody who's really invested in it. Like the way the RAs described it is that somebody who's emotionally engaged is like, they've been waiting their whole lives for you to ask you this question and they are ready to go and <laughs> they just go off. And, but it's not like in an angry, anger sense, it's more that they're just really enthusiastic about answering that question, regardless of whether or not it's a positive or negative opinion. And I think nonverbal information is much better suited to capture that than text-based information. Yep, I think you're right. I can completely imagine it. <laughs> okay, we have one more question in the chat. Um, when you segmented your data, you said that the call home model separated interviewer from the respondent about 87% of the time. To calculate this, did you have to manually review all of the audio clips or was this accuracy measure automated as well? Uh, the accuracy measure was estimated using a random sample in which somebody went through those samples and said, uh, yes or no, did it effectively segment the interviewer from the interviewee? Um, so there's other measures in this area that are used uh, to assess speaker diarization problems. It was difficult for me to think about ways to apply those measures in this context. So this is the best uh, that I could come up with. Um, yeah, so I think that this could be improved for sure. I mean, this is just using, it's not a trivial model to use. So I'd like to say that <laughs> Using Caldi and estimating this model is not the same thing as uploading something to the Google, uh, like a Google API. Like there's a lot of steps in this process. And so it's not a trivial matter, but at the same time, I think if I were to train my own speaker diarization model using my data or to do some sort of uh, transfer learning approach similar to what is done in like image classification problems, you'd probably get better, uh, better results, but it's really hard to do that in Caldi. Uh, sorry, transfer learning is really hard to do in Caldi train your own model, you could certainly do, but I didn't think I had enough data to do that in this context. 
Great. Okay. Do we have any other questions? I think we are actually coming up to the hour, so I'm not sure if there is time. We've got, okay, one final, final question. What would be the implications of this on current polarization research, if you have time for a short answer on that one? Yeah, I think the answer is simple, that uh, effective polarization, I think that this study shows is more ingrained in how kind of people are storing information, uh, potentially emotionally, uh, than it is just a reflection of survey responses. Now, I, I guarantee you this is not a surprise to people who have researched effective polarization, but I would say that outside of that literature, some might say that just because somebody says that they dislike Donald Trump doesn't mean that they have a passionate hatred for Donald Trump as you know, maybe the extreme version of effective polarization would imply. But this is showing that it does have an emotional context that is reflected in subtle changes in nonverbal behavior, which I would say makes those opinions more quote unquote true, if you will, uh, which I think is would be of interest to those scholars. Fantastic. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much for your seminar. I think we've all found it really exciting and engaging. And thank you to the audience for being here, joining us for our Civica Data Science seminar um, and for asking some great questions at the end there. Now, this is the last in our present series of the Civica Data Science seminars. We'll be restarting after the Easter break. Um, so please check out our website, socialdatascience.network, for more information about upcoming seminars. Um, thank you very much, Bryce. That was fantastic. Really great to have you here. And to the audience, I hope you join us again. Yes, thank you. And um, on April 7th, I'll be having a more kind of hands-on tutorial, not ah, necessarily fantastic. doing exactly this, but could be of interest to folks here. Uh, there we go. A plug a, I'm sure will be interesting. Yes. And if people want more details of that, um, perhaps we can try to get that up on our website as well. And we'll tweet Perfect. it out for you if you like. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank okay. You. Thank you, everyone.